Our first speaker is Dr. Fred Luskin, who is a graduate of Binghamton University. So he, of the four panelists, he's the, the alumni, like you are. Uh, he was here when Ronald Reagan was, uh, no, Jimmy Carter was president, right? So um, that was a while ago. That's about when I was in school. And um, obviously, a lot has changed in the world. But and when I remember psychology um, at that time, when I took it in college, um, it was very, it was a lot of talk about rats. Um, and I was wondering how that applies to human beings. It was probably close to the beginning of Fred's own career that there were a branch of psychologists who decided to make an attempt at understanding psychology from a more, even more practical point of view, from an academic point of view, to research the tools, techniques, and skills that would actually help people. Um, and of course, there was research involved with that. And in his amazing career at Stanford University, um, he's achieved many notable um, levels, including um, being uh, a member of the Department of Interpersonal Psychology, uh, professor. He's written a book himself, for Give for Good, which is profound description of his understanding about the importance of forgiveness, uh, which I think will be the subject that he will talk to us about in some ways. Uh, and the way we've organized these four presentations and the way I organize often my work with people as my patients, I don't love that word, um, is that we're going to start with the first two speakers who will talk about things we could perhaps let go of to make more room and space, things we hold on to and follow that with things that we can then, with that capacity, build upon. So there's some logic to how this was organized. Um, I'm going to take out my notes, too, because I want to make sure that I can address those things that highlighted to me on, on Fred's background. Um, he's the director of Stanford's Forgiveness Projects, which is a worldwide effort, eventually, that took him to places like Northern Ireland, Sierra Leone, and New York City after the World Trade Center incident. Um, where he applied some of his work you know, with the research and understanding that he had to help people who are actually in very severe need. Um, and um, I would say that I'd call his work, um, and he's labeled some of his own work as an, also an understanding for practical spirituality, which I sort of like. Um, so Fred, I, I probably didn't do you justice, but I am honored to listen to you today. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I haven't been back on this campus in, in decades, and um, it's very strange. Um, looks so different. But I, I had, I, I've lived in California now for about 30 years, and I, I was remembering one, like, slushy afternoon walking back from Binghamton in the middle of a snowstorm. Um, along Vestal Parkway because the buses weren't running from Binghamton and knowing before I got to campus I was getting so far away from upstate New York that it was like it, nobody could find me and very quickly after that I moved out west. I mean, it's, just a, it's just an interesting thing. And I now teach at Stanford and, and teach um, the kind of skills that were just being discussed on, on how to live a, a life where you can love and be productive. And, and, and from the work that I do, very specifically on forgiveness, it's very hard to love and be productive if you're bitter. Now, this work began for me as a very personal thing. My, my closest friend um, many, many years ago um, met someone, a woman, who took an immediate and total dislike to me and my partner at the time, and he, he stopped being my friend instantly. I mean, they came over for dinner one night, and you would have thought we fed them like dog food or something, but he, the relationship was done that night. And years later, I found out it was because of the intimacy that we shared, and she was too threatened by that, but I didn't know that then. And so my closest friend disappeared from my world instantly with no explanation and no connection. And I was devastated. 
And, and I was devastated in a way because I didn't know how to wrap myself around that kind of loss where I hadn't done anything and I couldn't figure it out. And, and, and the upshot of that was I became harsher and less trusting. Like I, I, I would evaluate things in terms of this loss and this, and this pain. And, 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 I, and, and it took a moment um, from my, my partner at that time saying to me, Fred, like, you're not the person I, I signed on to. Like, you're this bitchy pain in the butt. And, like, get over it. And, I, of course, I was already a therapist at that time, which is kind of embarrassing, but she kind of nudged me, get over it. And, and I had no idea how to get over it. Because, um, you know, 20 years ago, Therapists and psychologists weren't talking about the positive qualities like forgiveness and compassion and love, the things that actually give you a successful life. So I developed through my own suffering a capacity to forgive and I have codified that and researched that and taught it literally all around the world. But at its heart, is, is a desire to live a life where one can trust enough to love. And, and if you look at your own life, you will notice that each of us holds on to things, pain, wounds, disappointments, bitterness, things, decisions that you didn't like, politics that you would disagree with, your tribe or your ethnic group or your racial identity, people who violated that, people who disagree with your religion. We all have places in us which are tightly wound and covered with bitterness and mistrust. So we, we, we stop ourselves from loving. You know, I, I think of forgiveness now as, as nothing more than an eclipse of the sun and when we're hurt or bitter, we make believe that the sun doesn't exist, but if all that happened is we stuck a moon between us and the sun, and forgiveness is tank taking away that moon that blocks you from whatever goodness there is for you to experience. And, and it seems like both such a shame, but it's at the heart of why this world is such a violent place. It's because everybody is hurt. And many of us use our wounds to defend why it's okay to hurt other people. So we've done research in Northern Ireland where the, the Catholics and the Protestants defend their own cruelty because of what happened to them. Or in Sierra Leone or in any of the other places with Palestine and Israel. We, those are obvious examples, but you know, I've done it to my mother-in-law. Others of you do it to your ex-wife or your ex-husband or your, your boss who fired you or somebody who was spiteful or nasty. Like, you use the wounds, you use the pain to say, it's okay. That person or that tribe or that group, they're not fully human. So I can hurt them because they don't count. And, and it is this endless process of dehumanizing through our own injuries and our own wound that is at the core of so much of the hostility and violence that we're awash in. And, and it's, it's, you know, some religious groups talk about forgiveness, but it's not, it's not that deep a part of our cultural conversation. Now, I've done some very well-known work with, you know, big deals, like, again, political violence, and I did a project after the World Trade Center attack. But I believe the real need for forgiveness is at home, with, with the handful of people who really matter to us. We have a 50% divorce rate. It, it, it's obvious that we're not good at this. And, and, and what, I, what I go around talking is just to ask people sitting in the audience, like, there's got to be someone that you love that you're also pissed at. Or someone that you used to love that you haven't let go of some injury or some wound. And I'm here to remind you that it's time. You know, it, it's time to decouple, to, to sever the negativity that we create 
when the world is hurtful to us or treats us in ways that we don't want. And unfortunately, too many of us, so, some of our identity is based around this. Like we tell the stories about the ex-husband who was nasty or the mother who didn't love me or all of these things. And then it, it literally gets put into our DNA. And it gets wired into our brain in a way that's really, really, really hard to eliminate. And so when I, when I suggest that you think about someone you love to let go of something, it's because those pathways of love are already there. So you don't have to invent them. And you can learn through ways that are easier. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a moment's practice with you, just, just as an exemplar in, in the 10 minutes so that I have. So I'm going to ask everybody to please close their eyes. We're going to do a short guided meditation on this. So I'm going to ask you to please close your eyes and sit comfortably so that you're relaxed. And what I'd like you to do is see if you can, just for a moment, slow your breathing down a little bit. So you're consciously relaxing. And the easiest way to do that is by deepening your breathing just a bit, by opening your belly and diaphragm when you inhale so you're not holding tightness. So you inhale and you let your belly get bigger. And you exhale and let your belly contract. But you want to consciously practice relaxation. And you're actually consciously practicing being safe. Because an animal will not open its belly and be defenseless if it's under threat. And so you want to practice being safe. Safe in a way that you don't have to hold resentment. That you're, you're safe, you're okay just being with you. And then what I'd like you to do is bring an image to your mind of someone you clearly love. Just bring a, a rich, warm, loving image of somebody you're not in conflict with now so you can feel that love. So you want to bring an image to your mind and then want to see if you can feel it. Feel the affection, feel the care, feel the goodwill you have for this person and, and see if you can almost bring it into your heart. Like you want to, you want to bring it in. You're, you're activating the part of you that already knows how to forgive. It's, it's a quality in you that lies dormant. And so you want to open your heart up to love and goodness. You just want to feel that. And then you want to ask this part of you very gently, is there anyone close to me where I have a resentment or I'm not, I'm not done or I'm not happy with something? Is there anybody close to me where this loving part of me is willing to say enough? You're free. I'm free. You're free. That the part of you that's safe and loving and gentle doesn't need this tightness and is willing to release it into your own goodness. Like If there is, please try to do that. Please, from your mind, say, enough, thank you. And from your heart, quiet enough so that it's possible. And then let all that go. And let go of the image and let go of the feeling and very gently allow your eyes to open again and bring them back to center. 
And I'm just going to talk for another minute or two, but what it, when, I, when I was setting this up 20 years ago, the Stanford Forgiveness Project, nobody was teaching forgiveness. Almost nobody was reaching, researching forgiveness. And, and I understood through my own woundedness that that woundedness had kept me from certain capacities of certain abilities to trust and certain abilities to reach out because I felt unsafe. And, and what I realized over time was a lot of that was due to my closing down after the wound and after the hurt. And so what I had to do was open back up. I, I had to open my heart back up. I had to open up. And, and we showed through research that we can teach this. It's not, it's not that complicated. And when you open up, even in little ways, like you access the part of you, the, the, the intelligence, I mean the wiring in the brain, that has no reason to hate anybody. That, that's, just, that's just a perspective. And it's a mind-body perspective. But there are other perspectives right alongside that, that we just don't practice as much because so much of our physiology is so primitive and threat-wired. But it's right next to it. And, and so the, the message that I give is like a simple moment of gratitude opens you up to the part of you that would never want anybody else to suffer. Or a simple moment of appreciation of your partner or your parent or your best friend or your lover opens you up. And then, then you're in a space where forgiveness doesn't feel so ridiculous or compassion or kindness. And, and so, again, these are trainable skills. That, that's, that's the takeaway from the work that we've done on forgiveness and now I teach happiness classes. But the good news and, and the, the emphasis is on you can train yourself. Just like your primitive kind of physiology and your very threat-based nervous system trained your attention to be scared and, and to overemphasize what's wrong. But it doesn't take much to reorient that. And so I'm going to leave you with one more moment's practice. Just think of, as you sit here, just remember somebody who was kind to you in the last 24 hours. Just bring your mind to, it doesn't matter what it was. Did somebody like say something nice to you? Did somebody like do your laundry? Did somebody smile at you? Any, any act of kindness, just remember it and picture it. And then inside of you, just, I'll just say thank you. Thank you. And again, you can't go directly at forgiveness so easily because the resistance is enormous. But you can go around the sides. And when you're in a space where you have remembered when somebody was kind to you, you're going to be a lot more disposed to being agreeable to somebody who wasn't. Anyway, my time is up. I thank you for your attention.